the, the work that I'm talking about, I have a paper with Ariel Burstein uh, this forthcoming, and then a new one as well with Manolis, who is a great, I won't attempt to pronounce his last name, he still has not here to teach me to do it. Uh, but the three of us have a paper that's up now on Ariel's website um, that's more kind of a survey paper, but then that's the, the second paper is what has the material that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the, you know, we've had a Nobel Prize this fall given to Paul Romer, and, uh, you know, Elkanon has had very important work in this area. Uh, there's, uh, there was this idea that, that was being celebrated in this Nobel Prize that firms' investments in innovation have a character that's perhaps a little bit different than their investments in physical capital. And that what we needed is a new set of models to try to understand, you know, that difference and how that difference might relate to macroeconomic phenomena, and particularly growth of of aggregate productivity. And uh, these models have been developed over several decades uh, uh, the, uh, to include eventually quite rich descriptions of, uh, or uh, rich predictions for micro data on firm dynamics. And then it raises the question, okay, so I have a data, uh, I have a model that tells me something about firm dynamics, tells me something about uh, uh, aggregate productivity growth, there would be underlying uh, exogenous things like policies that you might change that would change the endogenous variables like firm dynamics and, and uh, productivity growth, and what's the relationship I should expect to see. But I would say that uh, despite, you know, I, I've only cited a little bit of the literature here, despite this, you know, large and continuing literature, uh, this work has not uh, been widely adopted for what I would call kind of quantitative policy analysis yet. Uh, so I, I have in mind that uh, just what I saw at the macroeconomics annual uh, this past year, uh, you know, we had a corporate tax reform that was passed at the end of 2017, and at the macroeconomics annual uh, in, in April, uh, Jim Perturba got together some people to, ha you know, to give presentations at the lunch about what do we expect the consequences of this corporate profits tax reform for the macroeconomy to be. And it was quite clear that the framework that was sort of dominant for that analysis is very familiar from many decades ago and would be taught in you know, first year macroeconomics courses. The first step, in the first step, you would calculate what is the impact of the tax change on the user cost of capital? And we'd come up with a prediction then for what's going to be the change in the capital output ratio as a result of that, you know, in the long run. And then you could just say, okay, well, if we go from this capital output ratio to that capital output ratio, how much is, say, labor productivity or output per person going to go up? And that, you really only need to know one number, which is, you know, the capital share or the, the uh, elasticity of output with respect to capital to answer that question, and everyone has their favorite capital share numbers or, or ways to come up with that. And the argument is then, you know, really down, boiled down to just like a, a few numbers. And I think some of the difficulty in uh, uh, applying those prop models that I mentioned previously for this type of policy analysis is that they appear to have many elements that complicate the analysis. There's uh, increasing returns to scale in many of the models. Uh, uh, there's uh, spillovers in research. Uh, uh, there's decisions about entry uh, by new firms that may be privately optimal but not necessarily socially optimal because of considerations of business dealing in these spillovers and increasing returns to scale. So we can't fall back on our usual tricks of, you know, saying, well, the, you know, the market is telling us what the private return is to various activities. Uh, in the market, we would expect the private and social returns to be equated and then use that to do kind of our growth accounting. Uh, so we have to do something else. We have to take into account that the kind of those standard tools don't work. So, uh, Ariel and I worked, I don't know, probably 
six years, maybe more, <laughs> trying to distill what we call like a benchmark model that nests uh, uh, a, a range of models in the literature that I'll identify uh, like a way to characterize the transition dynamics of those models uh, in terms of just a few sufficient statistics. And then perhaps if we buy into the framework of the models, we could then do policy analysis where we'd be back to arguing just about a few numbers. And so the paper that we have that's early and maybe forthcoming is focused on um, the question of, uh, let's say you, uh, you, know, you take it as given that through some change in policies, we get firms to invest more in innovation and we raise their innov the, the innovation intensity or their spending on innovative activities, say, by 10%. Then what do we think should happen to the growth rate of aggregate productivity? And we end up boiling that down to uh, two sufficient statistics. There's an immediate impact and then a long-run impact. Um, we argue in the paper that you can, you can, from the data, if you discipline those, those sufficient statistics, you can get fairly sharp predictions from a wide range of these models. Uh, for the short to medium run, the long run, there's a ton of uncertainty. That's a different paper. I'll talk about it. But today, I kind of want to illustrate the method, um, applying it to focus on what's the relationship between firm entry and productivity growth. And again, you get to get down to just a, a, actually one or two numbers that we need to know. And then when we stick them in, we can do an accounting. And, and this exercise will be slightly different than what was in the previous paper, because uh, if you do a policy experiment, if you say like, OK, we're going to change R&D subsidies by a certain amount, you need to kind of know the whole model to understand how much a firm's going to change their investments in innovation. But if you take it as given that you want to do an accounting about the past, like we're going to say, in the past, we have seen a decline in firm entry of a certain size. Then perhaps we don't have to know the full model to say what the corresponding uh, change in productivity is. So that, that will be an advantage. Hopefully, it will simplify what I'm trying to do today. So just to set the scene, everybody probably knows this, but I'll just show you two pictures. Over the last several decades in the United States, there's been a big decline in firm entry rates. Uh, a lot of people call this a, a, a drop in dynamism or a drop in entrepreneurial activity. And there's been declining growth of aggregate productivity. Uh, so, you know, and the question I want to pose is to what extent the two might be related. Um, so just to give you a sense of the decline in the entry rates of new firms, uh, there's, you know, widely available data from uh, business dynamic statistics. but. I'm quoting from a paper that I think was in the Carnegie Rochester conference series recently. And so what it shows uh, on the, this axis and in blue is what share of firms by just count are, uh, I think, one year old in a given year. So that's, we're measuring entry by you, you've just appeared this year. And so it went from, I don't know, 13% to about 8%. Uh, probably economically more significant would be what share of employment is in these new firms, because you could have a high count because they're quite small. And the share of employment has gone, I don't know, three and three quarters percent down near two percent. So it's been a substantial decline in the entry rate. And uh, the timing doesn't really line up, but I'll just show it anyway. Uh, you know, and then we know that at least since the financial crisis and actually slightly before, total factor productivity growth has slowed down. This is a, uh, this team I think have a paper in Brookings, and then this is a picture just from a, a summary of that they put at the San Francisco Fed. So this is TFP in the U.S. on a logarithmic scale, so a straight line again would be a constant growth rate, and you can kind of mentally draw whatever trend line you like between the, you know, through the first part of the data. And then you see starting around 2006 or so, if you extend your trend line up, there's going to be a gap that opens up that, you know, TFP growth just appears to be slower. So if you were to do an accounting 
that you say some force, something has happened to make, to reduce firm entry. If I write down a model in a certain class that I'll define in a bit, to match the, you know, I stick in that force and match the decline in firm entry, what prediction am I going to get out of that model for the decline in aggregate productivity or aggregate productivity growth? And so that's what I'm going to shoot for. Um, all right, so the talk outline is I want to, I want to actually show you the model. <laughs> I'll sort of hint at it. It'll be a, a class of models of firm innovation and productivity growth. And I just want to take, uh, uh, two components out of the model. There's kind of an abstract relationship between what I would call real innovative investment, which is a very hard concept to define in practice and data because, you know, <coughs> how do we deflate investment expenditures to arrive at that? But we'll just hold on to that concept. In the model, I'm also going to be able to relate firm entry to real innovative investment. <coughs> And I'll be able to use those two equations to substitute out for the real innovative investment and get like a relationship between two endogenous quantities. One is the rate of firm entry and the other is aggregate productivity growth. And I want to say in the, that will give me an equation for doing just an accounting that if entry changes, what's the predicted change in productivity? And I mean, then we'll measure the terms and then we'll just look at the answers. Um, and this would be more, you, some of you might want to argue with me about the numbers. Uh, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, is uh, yeah, sure, we could argue about the numbers if you like. Uh, I, I, I want to use this equation for saying how you, how you would get different answers by making different assumptions when you do the accounting. Um, all right. So the kind of the class of models is one uh, Ariel and I kind of settled on. Uh, in, our, in this paper uh, that will come out in the JPE. It's a model that kind of nests uh, a basic expanding variety of models, you know, the Romer 1990 paper, and then there's a number of papers. Urza Lutmer has two, and we have one from 2010. Uh, but it also nests models that bring in considerations of business stealing. So expanding varieties, there's not this conflict that if an entrant comes in with a new product, they might be you know, knocking somebody else out of business. Uh, Elkanon's obviously a pioneer in bringing up the idea that uh, uh, with business stealing, the gap between private and social incentives has another complication. Uh, and the early versions of these models had just innovation by entrants. Uh, later versions, Klet Kordam is famous, and then Asimoglu Kao is another one, have uh, innovation decisions being made simultaneously by entering firms and incumbent firms. Uh, ours also has something like that. That when you kind of put these together, end up uh, giving a picture of firm dynamics, which is similar to something that Garcia, Messia, Shea, and Clino have in a recent paper where they're trying to infer how much business stealing there is. Uh, but the uh, the basic idea you should have is in these models, you're going to have firms making entry decisions. You're going to have firms, incumbent firms, making decisions to uh, acquire new products, perhaps stealing them from other firms. You're going to have incumbent firms making decisions to improve the products that they currently have. All of these might be going on. Uh, uh, and then uh, kind of the class that we define, this is kind of canonical examples in the class impose enough, uh, they, have, they impose something like a strong form of Girard's law at the product level so that you can do what I call dynamic aggregation. It really simplifies the state variables you have to keep track of. Now many of the more recent papers in this literature don't do that. So like, you know, Ufuk Aksijit has a lot of work that I haven't put up here because his models don't satisfy that aggregation property. So I have to say what we're doing today is a benchmark, and then you'd have to ask questions about, well, for these other models, how far would they deviate from the benchmark? The advantage of the benchmark is you can do everything by hand. <laughs> and the other ones, you have to make a computer hot to uh, figure out what's going on. All right. so. Um, so first I want to uh, start with what I call the static aggregation that these models share, and then 
I'll, I'll, I'll just jump to the dynamic aggregation. So the, the, the basic idea of the model is how do we uh, uh, embellish the standard growth model is that we add a new state variable, which is uh, a measure of kind of knowledge at this point in time in the society, which in the models is typically we're going to have a range of intermediate inputs. An intermediate input is distinguished by the productivity with which it can be produced. And then you have here, like what's the measure of intermediate inputs with a particular frontier productivity that you know, we're capable of producing as a society? And uh, uh, then those intermediate inputs are included in, uh, you know, aggregated with the CS aggregator reduce final output. And uh, so these two things are state variables that will evolve over time, this through physical investment, this through innovative investment. And they'll both determine the productive capacity of the economy. But this CS structure, uh, if you assume uh, that all firms, all of these uh, you notice I didn't impose, this is a constant return to the scale production function. I don't impose the form on it. Uh, I do have to impose something like uh, uniform markups, but if all the factors can move across production of these intermediate inputs smoothly, then you get a static aggregation that the, uh, that the current output of the economy is going to be uh, just a function of the aggregate physical capital stock the aggregate amount of labor that you devote to current production, and then uh, a moment of this measure of productivities, which then gives you, I'm going to call that thing, it's going to look like TFP when you measure it in the economy. That's going to say how this kind of stock of knowledge affects TFP. And this term can grow, you know, two ways that have been done in the literature. This is a measure, it's not a distribution. So you, you can make it bigger, and that's uh, uh, expanding varieties. Or you can, uh, this is now a distribution, because you divide by the total measure. You can uh, replace low Z intermediate products with high Z intermediate products, and then hence move up this notion of an average and so I'll call that a move in average productivity. So either of those are kind of equivalent in terms of raising, say, output per worker, you know, holding fixed the capital stock, or raising TFP. Statistical agencies, not just the United States, but my understanding is worldwide, have embraced the idea that we need to expand our notion of capital to uh, 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 include something connected to ideas. My understanding in the United States is, so we, in 2013, they revised the National Government Product Accounts to include uh, investment in what they call intellectual property products. Uh, so you and I are both in LA. Uh, movies are in there, uh, which, you know, I like, we can measure LA's contribution to the capital stock that way. Um, patents are in there, uh, uh, software's in there. Uh, they have a principle that they measure spending on uh, the creation of items that can be sold. So like a patent can be sold, movie rights can be sold, things like that can be, software obviously can be sold. So th that expenditure flow is, is counted in investment. Um, the uh, other things, you know, some people argue for we should put advertising in, we should put uh, I expenditure on, on brand capacity in, so they don't, uh, that has not yet been included. It may not be included because of the measurement problems. Anyway, so when, when you talk about measurement of TFP, like when we go to measure TFP using the national and product account data, say for the you know, non-financial corporate sector, we go in and we, oh, well, no, let me stop. What do they do with that investment spending is that they just use a standard uh, perpetual inventory method to accumulate it, and they just stick it into the fixed asset tables. They make up some depreciation rate, which they say is pretty much made up. 
and they make up a price deflator, which they say is pretty much made up. And so there's just be a number in the fixed asset tables for a, a capital stock of like artistic originals. And you know, uh, it, makes, it raises questions like when the sound of music goes into the public domain, you know, uh, that will drop out of the capital stock, but is, it, is society worse off because of that? You know, but anyway, I don't want to get into that. When we measure TFP, we take all of that out and, again, and record it in the context of our model as actually uh, we have labor that's allocated to research, and so we have expenditure on research. So, so I agree that if you're going to come at the data with a model of this form, you, you have to take the NIPA and the fixed asset tables and like make adjustments. This is you know, standard stuff. Even going back to you know real business cycle models, the adjustments you have to make uh, to get it to get it to be a model consistent measurement. So our our procedure is usually to call a certain number of things K expenditure on a certain number of things innovative activities, and then when we go to the NIPA, we take them out and recalculate TFP based on that. So you're you're right that the picture I showed you of TFP is not entirely model consistent, but it's. I just wanted it to be suggested that TFP growth has slowed down. All right, so, um, so I say there's going to be this abstract idea of real innovate, innovative investment. So that you see you know, dollars being spent or labor being employed in, say, R&D activities. But you know, what's the real output of that, uh, 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 of that investment is unclear. But the models are set up in a structure such that uh, a, a constant levels of investment by incumbents improving their product, uh, uh, incumbents in acquiring new products, uh, entrants uh, in coming in, you know, normalized by something. It's often normalized by the measure of products that are out there. The constant levels of those investments produce a constant growth rate of TFP. All right. And, uh, and so then the question we want to ask is, uh, kind of this is some kind of variable we don't necessarily observe, but it could go up or down, and it's going to have some impact on TFP growth, investment in entry, and it's also going to have some impact on observed entry rates in the model. And so then we want to put those two equations together and relate in changes in entry rates to changes in, in productivity growth. OK, so, um, so now I have to say something about that technology of entry that is, uh, uh, so you notice I don't have to say much else about the model. <laughs> that was a relatively abstract presentation of that relationship. Uh, the technology of entry, though, uh, does have a special form that I would call, maybe borrowing a word from Ugo, it's replicable. So what I mean by that is, if you double the real investment in entry in a given period, you're going to get twice as many entrants of, of the same quality. So they, you won't run into diminishing returns from that. So that's going to be an assumption we impose. So the idea is like one unit of investment in entry, or one cre creation of one entrant, what happens is that entrant will come in and at, at t, at, at period t plus 1, that entrant will then have the capacity to produce some intermediate good with some z. And uh, it could be deterministic or random, but it'll be drawn, the, the productivity will be drawn from some distribution. And then if there's business stealing, you know, they may knock somebody off. They may displace a current producer. But these things, are going to be parameters that are functions of t. And uh, this is per entrant. So if we double the volume of entry, we'll get twice as many of these things. And so the, um, the assumption about these distributions that these models share in common and that we need is that uh, they shift up with the average level of z of the incumbents. So that what this will mean is, Entrants will have the same size because they'll have the same productivity relative to incumbents on a balanced growth path. 
and each individual entrant. This is the, the spillover that is needed to create that. But um, uh, this will give us the form that the kind of the aggregate across, uh, or the expectation of this for a given entrant of what I would call the net contribution to, to productivity. You come in with a certain Z, you knock people off. That's why there's a minus. This is a net contribution. It has this, this simple form where this is now a constant parameter and that's a constant parameter. And then that's just average productivity. So that's the, the kind of the restriction we have to put on the entry technology. Um, so now we're kind of ready to go. Um, how do we kind of see things in data? Well, that the results I gave you about static aggregation are derived from the observation that when factors are mobile across locations and with constant markups, employment shares in a product, like the amount of labor that's employed or the revenue that's coming, that's in the sales of the product or the amount of capital employed in the product, it's just the ratio of the Z for the particular product to the aggregate Z you know, to that power. That's just a property of the CES. Um, and so uh, when, we see, when I talk about the size of the product, we're seeing its little Z relative to the aggregate. But now think about taking what we call the share of employment in entering firms that, in that graph that I showed you like the 3% of employment was in entering firms. Well, how do, what is that share of employment in entering firms is? You add up this number across all the entrants, that's what this is, and that gives you the share of employment. But if you kind of look at that formula, this z to the rho minus 1 is the sum across all the firms in the economy of that little z to the rho minus 1. And when we're taking the employment share of entrance, we're saying what is kind of the productivity of entrance as a proportion of the total productivity. So we're seeing, in some sense, directly from their employment share, their, contra their current contribution to aggregate productivity. So that's going to be important. And the fact that um, employment, I mean, that entry is replicable just says then that uh, the employment share is directly proportional to this very difficult measure, you know, difficult to measure notion of real investment. And then, of course, this, you know, aggregate, this is one over aggregate productivity growth to the elasticity of uh, substitution. And this is a time invariant parameter, which was coming from that assumption I made about spillovers for entrance. Okay. So you could think about log linearizing this equation and say that you know, the deviation of the employment share from any central value is telling you, you know, is related to the deviation of this investment from, in log terms from some central value, and the deviation of productivity growth to the rho minus one from some central value. So that's one of the equations that I'm going to want to use to get rid of this difficult to observe term. All right. Then the other equation I'm going to use is just, I mean, if you want to focus on the impact of changes in entry on productivity growth, we're going to need to hold investment by incumbents fixed. So let's just do that mechanically. And then we can argue later about it. does that make any sense with any policy experiment, and so we'll come back to that. But for the moment, just think about holding these abstract notions of investment by incumbents fixed at whatever level and just vary XET and do it around some central point. OK. And so, I mean, this is just a definition. This is the elasticity of G with respect to changes in entry. And so this will be a parameter that we need to uh, figure out what it is. And that's essentially going to be the one number we need to come up with. <laughs> uh, well, I'll show you what it comes. So put these two equations together. We have the equation I just showed you, and we have the log linearized version of the entry share equation. And so we now have an equation that says to a first uh, order approximation, uh, aggregate productivity growth relative to some central value is just this coefficient times uh, the entry share relative to some central value. 
And then the accounting, and so well, sort of, this is a number we need to come up with. And then, so the accounting is, I'm just gonna iterate on that equation and say, if I, if I look for say 20 years of data or cap T years of data, and I, if I have data on uh, the entry share relative to some initial value, I can add those up. I have the entry share initial value relative to the central value I'm using in my first order approximation. And I have uh, the old productivity growth trend relative to the productivity growth trend I'm using in my central value. These are all the terms that we need to pin down, or these are the, essentially the only terms we need to pin down to do this accounting to say, how did the observed decline in entry, what's the model's prediction for the change in productivity growth or the change in the level of productivity relative to trend over that 20 year period that we should expect out of this class of models. The idea is I'm using parts of the model that are not impacted by policies or population growth. So other parts of the model would tell you if I did the counterfactual of changing the population growth rate, how, how, would, the, uh, how would stuff change? And I'll show you what it matters. It's going to, it's, these different thought experiments are going to affect these terms differently. And then you'll see how you get different, you see how you get different answers. But everything is going to have to come through these terms in relating these two endogenous quantities. That's the, you know, maybe it, it doesn't, perhaps it doesn't clarify the argument, but at least it organizes it. <laughs> this is what we're debating over. Okay, so I, I kind of want to show that. So let's talk about measuring the terms. So this is the prediction, and I just like, so what is this? Ariel says I shouldn't put this picture in because this is data, and you're telling what the prediction of the model is. Well, I'll put it anyway. So what's the term? There's like this black line, I just drew it in for fun. That's the old growth trend. That's the GZ old. And then the model say something happens to productivity, and that arrow after a certain length of time is, uh, uh, is the cumulative you know, whatever, decline in productivity relative to trend. In the US, it's about 10 percentage points in the data. And so, like, that gives you a sense of a number of what we might shoot for. Can we, is, is the numbers I come up with big or small uh, relative to the data? Um, all right. So what is this term in here? Well, I mean, it's kind of an integral. Uh, it's like if I took that original picture about uh, employment shares in uh, entering firms, and the black line is, say, my initial one, my SE0. I mean, this, this should be in log space. It's not, so just pretend it is. Then there's some decline in the share. That sum is just the shaded area. It's the integral there. And so you, you know, that's, that's what that number is going to be. Um, the, so what is this theta g? Well, the theta g is uh, the elasticity of uh, aggregate uh, productivity growth with respect to uh, this uh, uh, unobserved real investment in entry. But it's bounded above if there was, you know, if, if the, if the uh, gross and net contribution of entrance to aggregate productivity is the same, so there's no business dealing. It's bounded above by the employment share that you observe or that you pick for your central value and this elasticity of substitution. I'm going to use a row of four. So it'd be like one third the employment share. It'll be less than that if there's business stealing. And, and, and so what you want to measure is the net contribution of entry. But at least we're going to have an upper bound on how big this thing can be, you know, at the, at the employment share. So, in reality, even though the model has a lot of features, the implications for this relationship are going to be pretty tightly restricted by the data. Uh, all right, so then they have these other two terms, which is where all the considerations that you come in are going to, uh, uh, are going to come. So what we do when we apply the model is we use the balanced growth path that you're converging to as the central value. So uh, some policy changes and some versions of these models 
the long run growth rate is invariant to the policy change. And so then we could make the argument that the old growth rate and the new growth rate would be the same and correspondingly the old BGP employment share and the new one would be the same. So these terms would disappear. But anytime you do an experiment, like say a demographic change, that we have a permanent decline in the, in the population growth rate, a lot of these models would say, well, we're going to have some change in this term, and there'll be a corresponding change in this term, so we have to take those into account. But it's not that hard. I mean, we can ballpark numbers. We'll, we'll do it in a second. Okay, so the... Uh, <coughs> So then you might say, Andy, you're crazy. <laughs> you're, all you're doing is varying entry and you're leaving investment by, uh, by incumbents is fixed over time. Uh, you know, is there any justification in the model for doing that? I mean, you can always just do it if you want to as an accountant. But is there any justification in the model that, for doing that? There is actually, um, if, if you assume, like Clet Cordum and many others, that when incumbents firms invest that they have uh, like increasing costs of investment, they have a, a convex cost of investment, and we have this assumption that entry is replicable, then uh, in the transition from, say, some starting point to a balanced growth path, if you don't change policies, j just the economy transitions to its new path, uh, all the adjustment comes in entry, and that the investment by incumbents is actually constant on the path. And uh, 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 so these are kind of conditions for that. There is an additional thing you need. You need to go to continuous time, or there's this whatever. It's a detail. But basically, there are some assumptions that are kind of painful. You can get uh, that, that it, it does actually make sense to think of the only thing that's adjusting is entry in the transition. So the, the three counterfactual experiments are the first. We're going to do a uniform tax on innovation. So, the, uh, what that means is it's going to hit, it's just going to make research more expensive. It's like we defund universities or something. Um, and uh, what the, what the important thing about there is it doesn't affect the relative costs of investment by entrants and incumbents. So we're going to end up in a place with the same growth rate. Well, this is with, whatever, we can talk about that. It's going to end up with the same long-run growth rate of, of, of TFP and the, actually the same entry share. You just transition to a balanced growth path with a lower level of TFP. And uh, the second experiment is going to be discriminatory. It, 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 it hits entrance, the cost of investment by entrance specifically. And so the relative, what's going to happen in response to that is incumbents are going to just jump up their investment in innovation immediately, and we're going to transition to a uh, new balanced growth path that could potentially have a different growth rate. This, that has, depends on the technology for research. Chad Jones will argue for a technology where the answer is zero, you know, no, there's no change. Other people argue for there is a change. Uh, but the share of employment and entrance would permanently decline which would make data G go down if we approximate around the new point. And a slowdown in population growth you know, will actually reduce this long run growth rate. Uh, it will also reduce this share uh, and lower this. Uh, and, and so I just want to kind of go through the accounting in these three cases. So the, uh, oh, so in all the experiments, I'm going to hold fixed I'm going to say you jiggered with the model however you had to do it, and the policy experiment you're doing however you had to do it, so that over the data I've showed you, the decline in the share of employment entry is held fixed. So all three versions replicate the past data. And, and I'm just going to make this a round number of minus five, because that's a, about what it is. You can tell me it's six in long space, <laughs> whatever we can argue. But since it's linear, it's easy to do. In the first calibration, I'm going to just, you know, as I said, the uniform tax, I'm going to say there's no change in the long run growth rate. The employment share that we start from and eventually end up at in the entrance is the same at 2.7%. Um, 
we pull estimates of the extent of business stealing out of papers in the literature, shall we say, take those with a dramatic grain of salt. Uh, so that gives us, if we start from 2.7% for the employment share, and we use a row of four, you divide 2.7% by three, and you get you know, 0.09. And then if you, you know, we say a lot of the uh, entry is actually, uh, the net entry is much smaller, so you estimate the business stealing, we're going to go down to a third of that for our gamma parameter. But I'll, I'll tell you answers with, with the upper bound and with that. But this, in some sense, this is the numbers where we'd be arguing over for this theta g. And, and you know, I'm happy to discuss all kinds of things. So the answer you would get out of the model is over 20 years with this negative 5 for this integral of the log uh, uh, entry share, and this is what this number is with 0.03, you know, we have a 1.8, 1.7, 1.8 drop, cumulative drop in TFP, which is not trivial, but shall we say, it's not a big deal. It's, you know, a business cycle fluctuation. Now, it is permanent, so, I mean, but it's not the 10% that we saw in the data. So uh, this type of experiment would say, yeah, the decline in entry accounts for it a little bit, but not, not that much. Something else is going on in a, in a big way. So this basic case, not much. So then we thought about the next case. Let's, let's actually have the policy hit entrance specifically. And at first there was a typo. Oh, no, no, before we do that, let's just go to the upper bound. If we go to the upper bound, if you actually just say, fine, there actually is no business stealing, I can actually now get you know, a reasonable number, 4.5% decline in productivity. So if you, if you don't think business stealing is there, which would be an extreme assumption, that's going to kind of tell you the max that you could get out of this, this type of framework. Um, now let's just hit entry only. And so the economy, uh, and, I, and let me be Chad Jones and say I'm going to have a research technology where the long-run growth rate is policy invariant. So I'm going to set this term to zero. If I were uh, Howitt, I would argue for a different research technology, and this term wouldn't be zero. But I don't want to, whatever. You can, we can stick other numbers in here. For now, we are going to an experiment. But for now, let's just make that zero. Um, so to summarize, we're going to go to a lower theta, because we're going to a lower employment share. We're taxing entry enough to get it down to 1.6 share of uh, employment in the long run. Uh, that's going to make the employment share around which we're doing the approximation small. So that theta g gets smaller. This is now only 0.002. But this number is now positive. So I was like, what? <laughs> what happened here? This would, your model would say uh, the decline in entry contributed to uh, an increase in productivity. Uh, so mechanically, what's going on? This term is minus 5. This term is plus 0.05, because we, have a, we started at a high, this was like 2.7%. This is going down to 1.6%. And you multiply this by 20, so this is positive 10. So these two terms is now positive 5, not negative 5. So uh, I'm just, uh, uh, it's kind of, uh, you can't see it. So I, what I did is I, I lowered the SE bar. And when you take the integral, whatever, the triangle is <laughs> positive, not negative, is basically what happened. Intellectually, kind of what's happening here? If you're Chad Jones and you say that we're going to go to the same growth rate with a lower entry rate, what implicitly you're saying is incumbents, in response to this policy, raised their investment enough so that we can achieve the same growth rate of TFP with this lower investment by entrance. OK, in the long run. But what's going on in the, in the intermediate time? The first order conditions of the model say the adjustment of investment by incumbents is immediate. They immediately jump up to this higher level of investment. Whereas the data is saying the decline in entry is gradual. And 
these entry rates are all above the entry rate that's needed to achieve the same growth of productivity we had before. So that's why you're getting a positive number. That's the economics. And that's what's, that's just coming out of the assumptions of the model. So, you know, if you see somebody making this prediction, you'll now know how they did it. We know very little about the long run impacts of policies, right? Because we just don't have the data. The, the, the transition dynamics of these models, this is a big theme of our previous paper, is so slow that you need centuries of data to tell stuff about the, the research production function. So in some sense, it's almost unknowable, and, and uh, uh, at least with aggregate data. So it becomes like a religious debate. Uh, <laughs> and you should just be aware of the people have different stands. All right, so let's do the decline in population growth. So the decline in population growth, you know, we set parameters in the model you can believe them or not, but at the end of the day for this question, the only parameters that matter is we set them such that when we put in a decline of population growth, in the long run, the new uh, entry share is 1.64% again. I just did that for you know, pedagogical purposes. But we have like a 14 basis point decline in the long run TFP growth rate. I mean, you can adjust that by adjusting parameters. But let's just stick in oh, 14 basis points. I'm basically done. Um, so these terms are all the same. We're back to a negative number. Why? Because this term accumulates, that 14 basis point negative accumulates for uh, 20 years. But again, it's not the biggest contribution in the world. So, good. To conclude, uh, we see this research as a step towards making these models kind of useful for some kind of organizing, maybe a debate of how can we use them in, in policy stuff. Um, it looks to me like whatever it is that's driving the decline in entry likely has a modest impact on the you know, TFP uh, over the last 20 years, unless you sneak in an argument that that last term that I had like for population growth is much bigger than what I did. And with that, I'm done, so thanks.